guess I should say. Like uh, Jason, I've been up for seven hours or so already, so seems like evening to me, but... my glasses somewhere, so I'll make do the best I can. I can enlarge it, so that's good. So we're going to be continuing in this series that we've been in, the principles to live by. Uh, we've been kind of looking at how that you and I uh, have been given these five senses to walk through the natural world with, and also that these senses are also used in the spiritual realm, and that you and I need to exercise these senses not only to discern good from evil, but to be able to allow God to use those senses to reveal himself to you and I through his word. And so this morning we're going to be looking at uh, several passages of scripture. And uh, don't get alarmed, it's just going to be reading most of those. But what we're going to be looking at is how that through the scriptures, and especially through the scriptures of the Old Testament, just as Jesus opened the eyes of his disciples to understand everything that was written in the Psalms and in the law and in the prophets concerning him, then through the exercising of these senses, oh, look at that, she went and got them for me. <laughs> I knew I laid them down somewhere, but I wasn't really sure where, probably in my motorcycle jacket. <laughs> and uh, so thank you very much for that. And so we are, uh, are going to be learning how that the Spirit of God can use those five senses to open your mind and my mind and my heart and your heart and the eye of our understanding to be able to see Jesus throughout all of the writings of the Old Testament and especially those prophetic writings of the Old Testament. And so this morning we're going to be looking at how that the fulfillment of some of those prophecies has already come to pass so that we know that those are true and that God has already opened our eyes to see some of those things. But today we're going to hopefully see a little bit more of the congruency of those prophecies and how that though they were given to two different prophets at two different times, that they were given almost exactly word for word to two completely prophets, different prophets. And so as we look into the scriptures to look at that today, we're also going to be looking forward to some of the prophecies that are not yet fulfilled. And we kind of touched on that last week as we looked into the book of Ezekiel and saw Christ through the book of Ezekiel. And more specifically, the calling of Ezekiel to be a prophet and then how he was allowed to see what we're also going to be looking at again today that millennial time of the reign of Christ here on the face of the earth from the seat of his father David in the very city of Jerusalem for over a thousand year reign of Christ during that time. So before we go any further, let's open in prayer and then we're going to get right into the message because there are a lot of scriptures to cover today. Father, thank you for your word and thank you, Father, for allowing us to see you in your word. To see how that not only have these prophecies been fulfilled or can con continually being fulfilled, but Lord, that those prophecies which are still awaiting fulfillment, that we can look forward with an expectant hope, knowing that the same God who has already, already fulfilled the prophetic statements that have already been made through the prophets of old, and how that we can look now into that and see Christ in those that we can just as certainly and just as assuredly look forward to the fulfillment of the prophecies that speak of the future reign of Christ as well and all of the things that are still being unfolded before our eyes each and every day. We thank you that even though that we live in a time where it's very easy to discern that we're in the last days, we're grateful for those that are preaching the good news we're grateful for those that continue to uh, have a hunger and a thirst for the things of God. For we know that if apostasy was all around us and people were falling away all around us, that it might be the perfect atmosphere for the Antichrist to rise to power. <coughs> and so we're thankful 
for those that are still diligently seeking after you and that the gospel is being received in the way that it is all around our country and even still around the world today. And so we thank you for the souls that are being saved each and every day. And our simple prayer is that you would help us to reach more here in the Waterford area and in this community that we serve so that we might be able to bring them into the kingdom and show them how that your prophetic word has not already been fulfilled, but will continually be fulfilled by the same God who's already fulfilled all that was previously spoken. And we give you thanks and we give you praise this morning. And we ask you to place your words inside of your servant's mouth as we look into your word again this morning. Open the eyes of our understanding and let us see as we give all the praise, the honor and glory to you in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. We're going to start off uh, looking at two different uh, prophets who were serving around the same time, but not at the same time. And so there were some years that overlapped. Isaiah served much longer than Micah did, but nevertheless, the years overlapped some, but they weren't given at exactly the same times. But in Isaiah chapter 2 and in verse 2, we can look at the things that we would normally celebrate at Christmas. And so if you like titles this morning, then the title of this morning's message is Good News in Troublesome Times. Because just as good news at this point in the timeline of the world's history, when these words were spoken in Isaiah chapter 2, we are in a time where troublesome times are all around us. We can see that the storms are increasing, the ferocity of those storms are increasing, and there are signs all around us that we are in the not only the last days, but perhaps in the very last hours. And so as we look at that, Many hearts are beginning to become troubled about what's going on, not only here in America, but all around the world. There seems to be wars and rumors of wars all around us. There seems to be a hatred that's growing and uh, increasing for the nation of Israel. And all of the things that we were told by the prophets that would happen in the days in which we find ourselves living. And so we want to find encouragement this morning by looking at those words which have already been fulfilled and that we have already, in a sense, based our salvation upon. If these prophetic passages of Scripture had not been fulfilled, then there would be no salvation because there would be no one who would have came to die for our sins and no one who would have been able to bear our sins so that you and I could be saved. So this was good news and troublesome times for the nation of Israel and for the world uh, surrounding Israel in the days that they were spoken. And it's good news for us today in the troublesome times in which we still find ourselves living in as well. In Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 2, it says, in the last days, and I just kind of frame the fact that we are in those last days that Isaiah was prophecy about right now. And so it says that in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established, a chief among the mountains, and it will be raised above the hills, and all nations will stream into it. Many people will come and say, Come, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples and they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation nor will they train for war anymore. Isn't that good news? With wars all around us, everywhere that there is a time that is coming when people will train for war no more. There'll only be love in people's hearts and a willingness to grow in love and in fellowship together. That's kind of hard to imagine in our day and time, isn't it not? Because there's always been war since I've been on the face of this earth and long before I was ever on the face of this earth and long after I'm off the face of this earth, no doubt, 
there will be wars that will continue. But a time is prophesied to come when people will train for war no more. And then if you fast forward through the Old Testament to the book of Micah, then in chapter 4 and verses 1 through 3, you'll see almost the exact same word-for-word -word prophecy given by two completely different prophets who, by the way, didn't really know one another either. And again, in Micah chapter 4, beginning in verse 1 through verse 3, it says, in the last days. Some people say, oh, he just copied that down. He read Isaiah and then copied it down and claimed it as his prophecy. No, I don't think so. Because God is able to confirm his word in the mouth of two or more witnesses. So when he gives something exactly almost word for word, you can be sure that that is going to come to pass. Amen. God said it, and that's all that we need to say about that, right? So it says, in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and the people will stream into it. Many nations will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways, that we may walk in his paths. And the law will go out from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he will judge between many peoples, he will settle disputes for strong nations far and wide, and they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Isn't that good news that that day is coming because it's not yet? Right now, people are still training for war. People are still entering into the services all over the world, and they're, they're training about how to defend their nation and training how to protect their nation from both foreign and domestic enemies. And I know that that's been something that at least men have thought about all of their lives. I remember when I was in school that the draft was still in place, and they ended the draft two years before that I graduated from high school. And I thought, whew, missed that one. <laughs> And I was thankful that I didn't have to answer the draft because most of the people that were 7 to 10 years older than I were, some of my cousins and everything else, they were called to Vietnam, and they had to go and fight in the war. And many of them did not come back home. And some of them that did come back home were never right again. And so we're thankful that the Lord saw fit to allow us to bypass that time of the timing of when I was brought into this world was just for such a time as this that we're in right now. And so the same is for you and those seating beside you today. You can say to them, you're here for just such a time as this. God has called you into this world, birthed you for the very purpose that he has for you right now in this time in which you and I find ourselves living. He wants to use us to reach our neighbors to reach our community, and to bring people into a relationship with him so that they may be saved from what is coming. Amen? And salvation is one of the greatest gifts that you and I can ever receive. So once again, looking prophetically at the scriptures that have already been fulfilled because we look first at what is not fulfilled yet so that we can look forward with the hope for these next passages of scripture that again are almost identical that have been fulfilled, that we can have the confident assurance that he will fulfill all of his word just as he has fulfilled parts of his word already today. So called God, again, confirms his truth in the mouth of two or more witnesses. In Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, what uh, uh, Hansel's Messiah was uh, deemed to be probably one of the greatest songs that's ever been written, one of the greatest compositions of music that's ever been written. Some people think it may be a worship song in heaven one day. Who knows? It is a wonderful piece of music. And uh, so as we look at it, it's written concerning Isaiah 9 and verse 6. And in Isaiah 9, verse 6, we're very familiar with this at every Christmas season. So you might call this Christmas in June. A lot of times people do Christmas in July. We're doing Christmas in June this morning. All right. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given, and the government 
will be upon his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor and Mighty God, Everlasting Father and the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it and upholding it with justice and with righteousness. From that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. This prophecy is two-part because it prophesizes the birth of Jesus Christ, but then it also prophesies the future ministry, everlasting ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ as he will reign forever, not only on the seat of David in Jerusalem, but then after that, forever and ever after that, for all of eternity. There'll be no end to his government. There'll be no end to his reign. Even as we sing that our God reigns. Our God reigns both now and forever. Never will he be not on the throne and reigning. Even however bad situations might get, he's still reigning upon the throne in heaven right now and eventually here on the earth in Jerusalem from the very throne of David in Jerusalem itself. But how was all this going to come about? How is all of this going to be put into motion by God who knows the end from the beginning? Well, in Micah 5.2, we get some more details to this prophecy and how it's going to come true. And again, we use these every Christmas season. And uh, even as the wise men showed up, the prophets who really weren't even looking for Jesus or the priests who weren't even really looking for Jesus at least knew what the scripture said even though they weren't obeying them and following them. And in Micah 5.2, Micah was allowed to prophesy, but you, Bethlehem of Papata, that though you are small among the clans of Judah, that out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old and from ancient times. So this one who's coming and going to be born in Bethlehem, though he's entering into this world in a fleshly human body, it's God in the flesh. And he has been forever. He existed. His origins are from of old and from ancient times. He has always existed, but he's going to come among us in a fleshly body, and he's going to dwell among us, and Bethlehem is going to be his birthplace. And we know that that was fulfilled because we all know the Christmas story. So again, because these scriptures were fulfilled, half of the prophecy was fulfilled. The other half will just as surely also be fulfilled. In Luke chapter 1, verse 30, 32 through 33, uh, it also, as the angel Gabriel showed up to Mary and to her husband Joseph, then the angel also gave these words which matched the prophecy that was already given. And so he said, you will be with child and will give birth to a son. And you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. So the angel announces the exact same prophecy. Maybe it's the same angel that gave the prophecies to Micah and to Isaiah. Who knows, right? That's how it could be so word for word because the angel repeats it again, almost word for word, right? And then as Jesus began his earthly ministry, the first time that he stood up in his earthly ministry and walked into the synagogues and opened up the, the scriptures. In Luke 4.18, it tells us the same thing that Isaiah had told us, that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, and for the release of the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of of the Lord's favor. Do you see God's hand at work here in all of this? He prophesied of a time when the one who would be a descendant of David would come into this world. He would be born 
and he would be born with the purpose of getting the people saved and restored unto God so that he could eventually reign forever over these people. God's plan from the beginning. Mike uh, had the opportunity to preach at NTC this morning, and uh, I was telling Jason a little joker story about that earlier, and I won't repeat it again now. But one of the things that I ask Mike and every person that I've ever mentored, including Jason, tell me what God's been up to from the beginning, and I'll believe your calls. And Mike admitted from the stage this morning how perplexing that question was to him and how perplexing many of the questions that I presented to him were throughout the time that I was mentoring him. I, I, I assume probably Jason feels the same way sometimes, uh, but I asked him very perplexing questions sometimes, right? But it's because Scripture assures us that our questions are not a problem to God. And he wants us to know what he's been up to since the beginning. And he wants us to know what he was up to in the beginning that still has not yet manifested itself as of yet. So all of these prophetic scriptures look at how God came into the darkness in the very beginning of time for the purpose of one day ruling and reigning over the people from Jerusalem. What's God been up to since the beginning? Restoring all things unto himself. That's what he's been up to. Amen? There's the answer to that age-old question, right? And Jesus announced that the first time that he stood up in the ministry. So how are the people going to be prepared for the millennial kingdom? you got to get saved. you got to come out of where you are and out of what you're doing and what you were born into. You were born into sin. And the good news in troublesome times is that God has provided a way for every single person on the face of the earth to avoid the wrath that is coming. And that is how right now he's preparing for what he's prophesied will come to pass in a future date. And if you're not a part of that preparation, then there's a different destiny for you than there is for the destiny of those who will answer the call of the Lord during this time to salvation so that we can be spared from the wrath to come and so that we can jointly and be co-heirs with him in this everlasting kingdom that he came into this world to set up. When Jesus came into this world, into the flesh, he said to everyone, the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. And we are now, as born-again believers, a part of that kingdom. And we are joint heirs with Christ over all of these things. And we are going to return with him to set up this millennial kingdom according to Revelation chapter 19. And if you haven't read it, I encourage you to go home and read it tonight. We're going to read it here in a minute anyway, so you won't have to wait till you get home. So this coming king that was prophesied about, this salvation that was prophesied about all throughout the word of God and fulfilled by Jesus Christ, he's also the same returning king. Folks, he's coming back. I know the rest of the world doesn't believe that today. Most of the world don't even believe he came the first time as the savior of the world. Much less that he's coming as the ultimate ruler to reign in majesty and splendor over his creation. But he's returning. He's coming back, just as he said. Look at what Revelation chapter 2 and verse 7 proclaims to the churches. We're the churches. All seven of those letters were written to each and every one of us. We've already talked about that, preached about that in previous weeks and months before this. So in the one that was written to Ephesus, in Revelation 2-7, the first church that was written, it says, He who has an ear to hear what the Spirit says to the churches, and to him who overcomes... Folks, tell, tell your neighbor, you've got to overcome. 
If you allow yourself to be overcome by everything that's in this world, then you are not an overcomer. You have to overcome the things that are trying to pull you down. Just as gravity keeps us from floating away and constantly is pulling us back down to the ground. No matter how high you try to jump, you're going to come back down. But no matter how high we try to climb in our relationship with God, sin is like gravity pulling us back down all the time. And yet Jesus came to set us free from the grip of that so that we can ascend into the heavens where he's seated in the Spirit and be caught up into the third heaven multiple times as Paul the Apostle was so that he can show us the things in his word that are yet to come and that just as certainly as the things that were spoken of as future events in their days in Isaiah and Micah, these events that are spoken of as future in our day in the book of Revelation and in the Gospel of Matthew and Luke and other places, they just as assuredly will be fulfilled exactly according to what God has already said because he is on his throne, he's watching over his word to make sure that it comes to pass exactly the way it is proclaimed. Amen? Heaven and earth will pass away, but the word of God will endure forever. He says to him who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to he who overcomes. What? I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. When you're an overcomer, guess what? Remember like we talked about last week about how the flaming cherubim are protecting the presence of God? You have access to the presence. And we can confidently and boldly through the blood of Jesus Christ come into the presence of the living God and eat of the tree of life. Every day we say, Lord, give me my daily portion of you, the bread of life, the living water. Feed my hunger and quench my thirst because I hunger and I thirst for your righteousness. Amen. To him who overcomes. I will give the right to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Paradise, by the way, right now is in heaven. Jesus took it back to heaven with him after he descended into the depths. And it was the bosom of Abraham, and it's now paradise. And he carried it back up to the holy new Jerusalem. And paradise is the throne of God today. Revelation 2, 26 through 29, writing also to one of the churches, it says, and to him who overcomes... And does my will to the end. I will give authority over the nations. Listen to this now. And he will rule with them with an iron scepter. He will dash them to pieces like pottery. And we would all kind of write that off right now. Well, that's speaking about Jesus. That was already said that he's going to rule and reign with a rod of iron. But listen to what he says. Because you have to hear what he is saying. Just. As I have received authority from my Father. Now he's speaking about himself. This is Jesus speaking about himself. I will also give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The morning star is the sunrise, folks. That means that the sun will rise upon your heart each and every morning, and God is the only one who can give that to you. And he promises to those who overcome the tendency to doubt what has been written, the tendency to try to belittle what has been written and overcomes all of those things, God will allow the sun to rise in your heart each and every day. And when you rise up early, the sun will rise in your heart even on a cloudy day. Amen? It's true. Put it into practice. In Revelation 19, 11 through 16 in closing. See, Sean was worried that this was going to be an all-day message. And it will probably be shorter than last week. In Revelation 19, 11 through 16, this is the epitome, folks. This is the fulfillment 
of the prophecy talking about all that Isaiah said, all that Micah said about the coming eternal kingdom, all about how that his throne will be with no end, all about the millennial reign of Jesus Christ from the seat of his father David in the very place of Jerusalem is fulfilled in Revelation 19. Get your eyes open this morning. Get your ears open this morning to hear and see what it is that the Lord is saying. He showed it to John, his servant. He said, I want to show you the future. I want to show you what's coming because I want you to be a prepared people for what I have prepared for you. And I want you to be ready for that. I want you to be ready for the majesty of that. I want you to be ready for the glory of that. And it starts by humbling ourselves before a mighty God and allowing him to do in our hearts what only he can do. Listen to what John saw. He said, I saw. God opened his eyes to see the future. And I want you to think about this for a moment now. It's been 1950 years since he showed John this vision. And the scoffers today will go, it ain't never come to pass yet. That's an ancient thing. But John saw it. Just as Isaiah saw the birth and Micah saw the birth and where it was going to take place and why it was going to take place, John saw the end of days. Just as clear. He said, I saw heaven standing open. And there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. It's describing the rider on the white horse. And Jesus is the only one who's called Faithful and True. This is Jesus sitting on a white horse. And with justice... He judges and makes war. His eyes are like a blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. I'm always curious about that. He is dressed in a robe that is dipped in blood, because it's only by the blood of Jesus that redemption takes place. And his name is the word of God because he is the word that became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. And the armies of heaven, this is the good part, the armies of heaven are following him, riding on white horses and dressed in white linen, white and clean. And people go, yeah, well, all the, you know, he is the captain of the Lord's army, you know, and the angelic hosts, they're the Lord's army. So this is Jesus returning with all of the angels. Not. Are the angels a part of this procession? Absolutely. They're coming to set the millennial kingdom. But the good news is that who's on these white horses also riding behind him is you and I who have believed what he said and have overcome. Amen? He's dressed in a robe dipped in blood. His name is the word of God. The armies of heaven are following him, riding on white horses. They're dressed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. The word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and as a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of every heart. There'll be no war as he busts through the clouds and the war of Armageddon's already taking place. There'll be no war. He'll simply speak a word, the same words that he spoke creation into existence with, and it'll all be over. Maybe it'll be the same words he spoke from the cross. It's finished. That's it. We're done with this. Right? Whatever that the words are, he only has to speak a word. 
He will rule them with an iron scepter. And he treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh there is a name that is written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Our returning King, our returning Lord, and we are returning with him to set up the millennial kingdom, the millennial reign of Christ upon the very seat of his father David that was prophesied about over 2,600 years ago. And it will be fulfilled exactly as it was spoken. Amen? Let's close right there. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this time in your word and in your presence. Thank you for solidifying your truth through your servant today. Solidify it in each and every one of our hearts, Lord. For those that are watching online, those that may watch online later on, may this be an encouragement to them as well as a conviction to them that if they've already surrendered to Christ and they've already been born again, let it be an encouragement of what is coming. If they are part of the crowd that still scoffs at these truths part of the crowd that's still filled with doubt and unbelief and they don't believe in Jesus or receive him as savior may it be a conviction to them that they're on one side or their other they're either returning with him to reign or they're being the ones up whom, upon whom the wrath of God is being poured out we get to choose. May we choose wisely. May we choose life and not death. May we choose Jesus, the one who is life, instead of choosing our own way, which is death. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the precious blood of Jesus, the Lamb of God, who sacrificed himself so that we could be returning with you at this point ruling and reigning with you throughout all of the rest of eternity. And we thank you and we praise you in the name of our Savior and our Lord, Jesus Christ. And everybody said, Amen. I invite everybody to stand up and join us in our closing song.
thank you for just setting this plan in motion, Lord, from the beginning days of creation. You knew we wouldn't be able to do it on our own, and you gave us that plan through your son, Jesus Christ, that we may be saved. And with Jesus being our Savior, Lord, he also becomes our King, our King. And we're so grateful that you've chosen us and enrolled us to be a part of that and to to help many others, Lord. We pray that as we go forth this week that you would use us in the way that you have um, planned for us to be used, that we would bring those who do not know you plant the seeds there, to bring them to know you, Lord, that that you can do the redemptive work that you have called them to do.